Hello again. I normally keep the historic detail around the art objects I talk about to a minimum, but this time, because I'm talking about a complex interplay between Celtic art, Anglo-Saxon and Viking, I need to explain a bit of the background, the historic background, to this complex period of English history in order to put the artworks in perspective. Uh, the other point I'll make at the beginning is that there are a large number of items, objects, artefacts. For example, the Staffordshire Hoard alone has almost 4,600 items. So I've had to be very selective. I've chosen one or two items from, of each style and from each period. So let's get started. Now, Despite the large number of household and military objects, there are relatively few artworks from the period, so there is a bit of a distorted view of what was produced. And um, in this context, by art, I mean any object like this one with a complex decorative surface that has clearly taken time and skill to produce. So what I've done is I've chosen a wide range of different types of item to convey the scope of what was made at the time. Now, typically, items of Celtic art are ornamental. They avoid straight lines. The patterns are often, as here, symmetrical. It also often involves complex symbolism, avoids the strict imitation of nature, which, of course, is central to the classical tradition of Greek and Roman art. The Anglo-Saxons were Germanic people who settled in England during the 5th century onwards. They spoke English and their art is best represented by the metalwork and jewellery, for example, at Sutton Hoo. And also a series of magnificent illuminated manuscripts. Their art is in some way similar to the Celts, but as we see here, may often include naturalistic bodies and plant forms. Viking art, also called Norse art, came from Scandinavia and the, the Vikings settled in England between the 8th and 11th centuries and interacted with the existing Celtic and Anglo-Saxon artistic traditions. Now our knowledge of Viking art is mostly from metal objects but we believe wood was the main artistic medium and so I've selected here a rare example of their art in wood, a wood carving at Ernst Stav Church in Norway and you can see it features intricate interlacing patterns, elaborate knotwork and symbolic animal forms. So I'll be going through these three um, periods chronologically, starting with Celtic art. The oldest. It emerged around 1200, 1000, 800 BC it gradually developed. By the way, Stonehenge, which you might associate with Celtic art, is not Celtic at all. It began about 3000 BC, so it's something like 2000 years prior to the earliest forms of Celtic art we know about. Now, Celtic art's divided into three periods, Hallstatt, Laten, and the Insular periods. And... Um, I'll start with the Hallstatt, which is often um, begins around, although there is some earlier work, it, it normally dated to begin around 800 BC to 450 BC. And this period is the roots, the foundation of Celtic culture and art when they developed their unique style. The second period, La Tenne, is from 450 to about the first century CE and is considered to be the prime period of Celtic art. 
and it's characterised by these swerving curvilinear patterns and it's the peak of the Celtic artistic achievement. Incidentally, La Ten is the name of a major site in Switzerland where um, a lot of this art work was found and m many of the periods and um, objects I'll be talking about are named after the location where they were found. Finally, insular art, Celtic art in the Middle Ages, was practised by the people of Ireland and what's now Scotland in the 700-year period from the Romans leaving Britain in the 5th century to the Romanesque art in the 12th century. You might incidentally wonder uh, what happened in between La Ten and the Insula period because I said La Ten ended in the 1st century and Insula began in the 5th century. So what about the 400-year gap? Well, it's a transitional period. It, it's sometimes called the late La Ten, sometimes the Romano-British period. It depends to some extent where in the country we're talking about. Because um, the of the influence of Roman art, it the, the influence occurred more in some places than others. So in Ireland and Northern Britain, where the influence was less, it's called late La Ten, where the influence of Roman art is greater in southern Britain, it's often called Romano-British Celtic art. But let's uh, look a bit more closely first at um, who, who were the Celts and where did they come from? And this map shows the distribution over time. The yellow is the earliest 6th century core Hallstatt territory. You see it overlaps with Switzerland. And um, it's mid, middle of middle mid Europe, and it's not um, the Celts weren't a, a single unified nation by any means. They were a number of tribes with similar language, similar religious beliefs, traditions, and culture. And it started to evolve, as I said, about 1200 BC, and the the earliest objects that we would describe as artworks were about 800 BC. Uh, the lightest green was the height of the Celtic expansion, about 275 BC. And then the green, that's the mid-green areas, are the areas where the Celtic language was spoken throughout the Middle Ages. And finally, as they got squeezed back, the dark areas are areas where the Celtic language remains uh, uh, widely spoken or to some extent spoken in the, pres in the present day. Uh, before I leave this, just I just wanted to expand on Stonehenge slightly. It predated the Celts by thousands of years. You might be wondering, I didn't actually say who built Stonehenge. Well, the answer is we don't know. All we can say is it was built by the indigenous Neolithic people who occupied the area for at least 1500 years from about 3100 to 1600 BCE. And there is some evidence that it was a much longer period. Some, some say that... Um, large-scale construction work was going on around Stonehenge over a 6,500-year period. So, Hallstatt, as I said, began about 800 BCE. The flourishing, saw, um, there was a flourishing of artistic expression across Central Europe. Metalwork items such as these stand out. There's, um, on the left, Hallstatt swords, there's a brooch and a decorated chariot. And we also find other metalwork like jewellery. Many of these artefacts served a symbolic and religious significance as well as having, in some cases like the swords, a practical function. Let's take the Stretveg cult wagon as an example of something with um, symbolic 
and or religious significance. It was part of a prince's grave. It was found in present day Austria. The female figure, just to give you a scale, is about 32 centimetres higher or about a foot high. And she is touching, holding up her hands to touch the base of the bowl. The wagon contains human figures with animals, possibly deer and um, horses. And the assumption, we don't really know, but the assumption is it represents some type of sacrificial device or ornament as the bowl containing a drink used in the ceremony, possibly, in other words, a libation. Although, indeed, some experts believe the bowl wasn't even part of the original wagon. Now, as trade routes spread across Europe, this Celtic artistic style spread with the trade, leading to regional variations across Europe in the Celtic art. And also Celtic art came across the art of um, Rome and Greece and and uh, Etruscan art and so on. And so there was an interchange of ideas as well. The um, This Hallstatt period is also known for its pottery, which had geometric patterns. It's uh, woodwork, although little of the woodwork survives, but it includes carved figures, especially heads, spoked wheels, textiles. The textiles, incidentally, are often finely woven, as you can see here, top right, and often come in the form of a tartan, which is um, a cloth woven with crossing uh, horizontal and vertical bands in multiple colours, forming simple or complex rectangular patterns. On the, the bottom right, you can see a Celtic leather shoe from the salt mines at Hallstatt, and that's how the leather has been preserved all this time, because of the salt. The uh, the shot in the middle of the base of a shoe, I'm showing because it shows how the shoe is worn. It's worn at the toe end, and archaeologists assumed that the reason for this is because it was used for climbing ladders and stairs in the mines. And we do find that few of the shoes have the heels worn down. Incidentally, the Hallstatt period, I, I won't go into this level of detail, but just to mention it, the Hallstatt period has been classified into four sub-periods. Uh, Hallstatt A and Hallstatt B are Bronze Age from about 1200 to 800. And Hallstatt C and D are Iron Age, starting in 800 to 450 BCE, the period I'll mostly be talking about. This, for example, is 550 BCE. It's the famous warrior of Hirschlanden, and it's the oldest life-size human statue north of the Alps. It's a warrior with an erection, wearing a torque or neck ring, a belt with a dagger and a pointed hat. It's made from sandstone, shows, as you can see, a lot of weathering, suggesting it was exposed to the elements, but it was found buried underground. Now, the statue was found buried alongside a barrow in what's now Germany, and the barrow contains 16 burials that took place over 150 years. And so one um, theory is that this statue was placed on top of the barrow and was weathered by the elements over a long period of time and then eventually fell from the top and became buried. It's also been suggested that uh, influences from art of other cultures influenced the production of this statue and we're thinking here of Greek figurative art possibly seen by the Celts on Greek black figure pots. This is much later. This is the next period, La Ten culture. And this is called the, and 
I, I hoped I got this roughly right. The Mucheskai Jerofitska. The Mucheskai Jerofitska hero or head uh, based on a town of the same name in the Czech Republic where it was discovered. And like the warrior of Hirschlanden, it's one of the best known of Celtic art, often found on, um, you know, brochures and documents and, bro uh, and books written about Celtic art from the Iron Age. And it's one, the, the two of them are one of the few large representations of all or part of the human body, which, as I said, Celtic art is mostly um, not naturalistic. It's um, uh, curvilinear forms. This is a head about 23 centimetres high with a moustache, and the figure is wearing again a talk, a neck band. You can see from a side view the face is almost flat with bulging eyes, and the hair, interestingly, is braided and appears to be shaven at the back. We believe this is a bust of a Celtic warrior. I mentioned the talk. It crops up quite often. Uh, talks and images of people wearing them. You might be wondering how they put them on. Well, they were put on by bending the arms and then bending them back. And um, you might be thinking, well, if you bend metal backwards and forwards all the time, it um, snaps because of the frequent bending. Uh, you're right. Um, the X-ray analysis shows that there is metal fatigue and it's thought that although a lot of the um, statues are shown wearing these talks, they were only worn on special occasions rather than day to day. And here's an example that makes the point. We know from X-ray analysis that all the strands underneath that copper sheath are broken. And so this is a repair because the torque has been bent backwards and forwards too often. And perhaps the wire at the front was added later to strengthen it so it would not fall off. Right, a little bit more history, because I've got to explain next where the Angles and Saxons came from. And you've got to remember that from about 43, common era, the Romans occupied England and they conquered and occupied most of southern England by 87 CE. Now, at this time, England was occupied by many different tri tribes and they rebelled against the Romans. The most famous, I think, is Boudicca of the Iceni tribe who revolted against the Romans in about 60 CE and they were all put down by the Romans who then ruled the country for about 400 years. And when they left in 410 the indigenous Celtic tribes remained and were known as the Britons. Now, when the Romans left, the country was invaded by a number of different tribes. The Angles came from modern day Denmark and occupied the area around the Wash. And the Saxons came from a small area of northern Germany and invaded southeast England. And the Jutes came from northern Denmark and invaded what's now Kent, marked EJ. And all this took place in the 5th century, as I said, after the Romans had left. And they conquered the British Celtic tribes in those areas. And in due course, there were seven, there ended up as seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms known as the Heptarchy. And each had its own king and... Let me show you them. The size of each area, I haven't marked the boundaries because they, they changed. They varied over time depending on the power of the king. And there were various battles between Northumbria, Mercia, Wessex, Kent, East Anglia, um, Essex and Sussex. 
Now, the term Anglo-Saxon is used to refer to the people who inhabited and ruled Britain from about 450 CE to the Norman invasion of 1066. And during the early 10th century, the various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were united by Edward the Elder and then Athelstan to form the Kingdom of England. And I'll come back to that when we talk about the Vikings. So let's look at the art of the Anglo-Saxons. Now this is a brooch because Clothes at the time were fastened with pins and brooches, and this is a silver gilded brooch, uh, gilded with gold, found in the grave of a woman from about the 5th or 6th century, together with two stamped pendants, um, a pair of tweezers, an iron knife and a waist buckle. The brooch is influenced by Scandinavian art and its complex motifs are a mixture of human and animal forms. If I put up this diagram, I won't go through the whole thing, but you can look at it yourself. It, it's difficult to decipher the various forms on the brooch itself, but the diagram gives you a better idea of the complexity of the various motifs, human and animal, or symbolic of human or animal. The brooch itself is obviously expensive, the craftsmanship exquisite, and we believe, we assume, the forms and figures, as they're so carefully worked, have a symbolic, social, possibly religious significance that's now lost. May, they may refer to stories and traditions, the mythology of the period, for example, the central bearded face might be Volton with ravens and other creatures and characters from mythology. It may have been intended to ward off evil or, or even to give the wearer strength, courage or wealth. Now, later, the post-Roman or insular period of Celtic art which was still practised by the people of Ireland and parts of Britain that the Anglo-Saxons hadn't reached in the 700-year period from Romans leaving to the 5th century, in the 5th century, to the 12th century. And this is an example. This is the Lindisfarne Gospel, one of the most uh, famous illuminated manuscripts of the period. In a bit of background, in 635, the Northumbrian, Northumbrian king Oswald summoned an Irish monk called Aidan from Iona. Now, Iona was an island monastery off the southwest coast of what's now Scotland, founded some uh, years before. And Oswald summoned Aidan to be bishop of his kingdom, and he granted Aidan and his companion monks, the small tidal island of Lindisfarne on which to found a monastery, which they did. And the Lindisfarne Gospel was produced later, around 715 to 720. It's now in the British Library. It's one of the finest works of the medieval period, and it's produced in a uh, style called insular art, or sometimes Hiberno-Saxon, and it combines Mediterranean, Anglo-Saxon and Celtic elements. We believe the Lindisfarne Gospel was the work of a monk called Edfrith, and he became Bishop of Lindisfarne in 698, and we know he died in 721. The text, by the way, is Latin, and this front page um, translated says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, although it's in Latin, it's translated, it's the first known translation of the Christian Gospels into Old English. And the Old English or Anglo-Saxon 
language is written alongside, you can see here, the text, or in the main body of the text between the lines of Latin. Another famous, equally famous, illuminated manuscript of the period is this one, the Book of Kells, sometimes called the Book of Columba, because it was created in a Columban monastery um, around 800 CE. And Columba, who founded the monastery sometime before, he was um, a, a 6th century Irish abbot, and he spread Christianity across what's now Scotland. And he was the one who founded the abbey on Iona, which became a leading religious centre. And you can see there's um, figures, human figures, animals, mythical beasts, Celtic knots, as we call them, interlacing patterns in vibrant colours. And many of the minor decorative elements are filled with Christian symbolism. And that adds to the meaning of the themes, the text and the illustrations. Uh, let me just show you another page. This is the a page showing the four evangelists, the four uh, writers of the Gospels. The top left is symbolically represented by an angel. It's Saint Matthew, the angel. Top right, a lion for Saint Mark. Bottom left, an ox for Saint Luke. And bottom right, an eagle for Saint John. And as I said, the Lindisfarne Gospels and the Book of Kells are both examples of insular or island style. It's a sort of combination of Celtic and Anglo-Saxon. And it was produced after the Romans left. And it was produced by Ireland and parts of Britain. And the style, the insular style, was is named that because it's different from the rest of Europe. That's why it's called the insular or island style. We now come to Sutton Hoo, the most impressive medieval grave to be found in Europe, dating from the 7th century. The burial mound itself contains a longship 27 metres long, and a burial chamber full of treasures. It was it started to be excavated in 1939, just before the Second World War, by an amateur archaeologist called Basil Brown, who was invited to excavate by the owner of the property, Edith Pretty. But when it became clear that it was a very important dig, it was taken over by national experts. And it contains, uh, as I said, a ship burial. And within that, there are feasting vessels, hanging bowls, silverware from Byzantium, textiles, gold accessories, garnets from Sri Lanka, and this, this iconic helmet with a human mask. It was clearly the grave of a very important person who died in the early 7th century, probably a king and possibly King Radvald, who ruled East Anglia. The person was left-handed, indicated by the pattern of wear on his sword, which was laid on his right side, and his helmet was laid on his left side, wrapped in a cloth. This is a reconstruction by the Royal Armoury of what the original might have looked like. It's decorated, as you see, with fighting and dancing warriors, fierce creatures, and the face mask itself forms either a, it's a pair of gilded boar's heads or um, a dragon whose wings make the eyebrows. If you look at the eyebrows, you can see there's a, a head at the end. And... Um, the uh, the it goes down to a tail which makes up the moustache the head of the um the dragon is at the top and if you interpret it as two boars the heads are up the end of what as a dragon 
are the dragon's wings. Maybe it's um, a combination of both. Now, the Sutton Who discoveries provide us with a very rich source of archaeological evidence of the Anglo-Saxon period, and it, it changed our understanding of what was happening in the period, uh, particularly our appreciation of the excellence of the artwork that was produced. And I've selected a few items, a purse lid, a uh, buckle and shoulder clasp, and these are just a few of the 263 items. It, it reveals that it was a very cultured and sophisticated society. And as I said, it shows there were international trade connections because there are items from Byzantium, Egypt and across Europe. The site is still being researched Although the dig started in 1939, it's still a focus of ongoing research and still revealing more about life in Anglo-Saxon England. A very different uh, hoard or collection is the Staffordshire hoard. The largest hoard of Anglo-Saxon gold and silver yet found, it consists of almost 4,600 items and metal, metal fragments amounting in total to, I'll, I'll tell you the figures, 5.1 kilos, that is 11 pounds of gold, 1.4 kilos or 3 pounds of silver, and some 3,500 pieces of garnet cloisonné jewellery, of which I'm showing you a selection here. And I'll I just take a, a minute to describe what cloisonné is. It's an ancient and skilled metalworking technique using coloured glass. Um, this it, it typically is made by soldering gold wires onto a metal base to create the outlines that, and compartments. Then finely ground glass mixed with a pigment is then mixed with water to create a paste. And then the paste is used to fill each compartment with a different colour. The object is then fired in a kiln at a high temperature and that melts the glass, fuses it with the metal and the colouring suffuses through the glass. And finally, it's smoothed and polished. We believe the technique was discovered first in the Middle East about 8th century BCE and from there spread to China, Byzantium and Europe. Now this hoard, the Staffordshire hoard, was most likely buried between 650 and 675 CE and contains artefacts probably made uh, 6th and 7th century. It was discovered in 2009 in a field near Lichfield in Staffordshire and that was in what was then the Kingdom of Mercia. We don't know why it was buried there, but apart from three religious items, they're all military. There's no domestic objects that you might expect, no vessels, eating utensils, uh, which are commonly found. And there's more gold here than you normally find. So you can make various assumptions about what happened. I mean, m maybe it was the scene of a battle. Um, maybe a, a one or a group of people collected items and then buried them to come back later, but were killed in the meantime. And so the location was lost until 2009. We don't really know. Crosses. This is the Ruth Ruthwell or Ruthwell Cross and the Bewcastle Cross. The Ruthwell Cross is a stone Anglo-Saxon cross, probably around the 8th century um, in Ruthwell, now, now in Scotland, part of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria at the time. And it was smashed by Presbyterian iconoclasts in 1642 but luckily they left the pieces in the churchyard 
and later in the 19th century they were restored and re-erected first in the garden and then moved to their its current location inside the church and I've shown you a picture of it inside the church here but the Bew Castle cross is still in its original position in the churchyard of St Cuthbert's at Bew Castle that's in Cumbria and it dates from 7th or 8th century and there are uh, relief carvings of human figures and inscriptions in the runic alphabet. The two crosses have been described by Nicholas Pevsner, the art historian, as the greatest achievement of their date in the whole of Europe. But even greater and better known is the Alfred Jewel, a piece of Anglo-Saxon goldsmith work made of enamel and quartz enclosed in gold with a cloisonné uh, figure on the front. Discovered in 1693 in Somerset, England, now one of the most popular exhibits at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Dated to late 19th, 9th century, the reign of Alfred the Great, and it is inscribed with um, the words in translation, Alfred ordered me made. You might be wondering what its purpose was. It's now generally accepted. There's been a lot of debate, but it's generally accepted that a rod, a wooden rod, was attached to the base, the bottom of this object. And the jewel, the jeweled part you held in your hand and you used the, the pointer stick to follow words when you were reading a book. Uh, uh, exceptional and unusual example of Anglo-Saxon jewellery. This is King Donert's stone, 875. Um, now, the from the 5th to the 9th century, the art of the Picts in Scotland is primarily known through stone sculpture. There are a few small pieces of metal work found, some, some of high quality, no known illuminated manuscripts. Um, but this stone is um, from Cornwall, St. Clear in Cornwall, and the, the Donert stone is on the right, and the, the other stone on the left is called the other half stone. And we know it's King Donert because it's written on it. There's an inscription on it. And it says that it was built for the good of his soul. And it was in the 5th century that Christianity was first brought to Cornwall by monks from Wales and Ireland. And the early missionaries would erect wooden crosses to show places where they'd won victories for Christ, where they'd converted a community. And over time, these places became sanctified and the wooden crosses were often replaced by stone ones. Incidentally, this um, stone, which was constructed for a king, has a hidden vault underneath. It was discovered in the 19th century that about three metres down, carved out of the solid rock, there is a cross a large cruciform vault about 130 centimetres or four foot wide, the length and the arms, and it's about six metres or 18 feet long and slightly less wide. So a very large cross shape carved out of the solid rock, three metres underneath these stones with a tunnel that connects the cruciform vault to another passage but its purpose and its connection with the crosses if any is unknown so let's move on to the time of ethelred 910 and talk about the vikings by the 10th century the vikings occupied the north east of england 
the um, part labelled the Dane Law. The rest of the country consisted of Northumbria, um, partly occupied by the um, the Vikings, but mostly English. The um, what's called here English Mercia and Wessex. Now Wessex was further down in the south, they're further away from the Viking area, the Danelaw area, and so it was protected from invasion, and so it, it grew stronger. And key figures are King Alfred the Great and Edward the Elder, and they strengthened Wessex's military power, forged alliances with, for example, Mercia, and Edward the Elder's son, Athelstan, united all of England by conquering Northumberland in 927. And the, the country England has survived up to the present day as a political unit, but of course was conquered by the Normans in 1066. But it, it began in 927. Now, the Vikings, I'm going to talk next about um, Viking art. The Vikings came from Scandinavia, which includes modern day Denmark, Norway and Sweden. And the Viking Age, from about 800 CE to 1050, saw these seafaring warriors raid and colonise large parts of Europe. They weren't a single race as such, but rather small groups from various regions of Scandinavia with a lot of um, common uh, mythology and purpose. At the time, Scandinavia was becoming overpopulated and that's one of the reasons the Viking warriors left the area to find other areas to plunder and colonise. Um, also, I guess it was the lure of, of adventure. They made um, hit and run raids in England and in fact o over Europe, but also engaged in peaceful trade and exploration, established cities, set up colonies, for example, Dublin and Ireland, Normandy and France. And the art, their art, included manuscript illumination, as well as metalwork, jewellery and architecture. And their art can be divided into six main styles, each with distinct characteristics, although similar. And the styles are named after the areas where the decorated objects were first found. And so in roughly chronological order, although their dates do overlap. The earliest was the Oseberg, then the Boru, then the Yaling, the Marmon, the Ringerika, and the Ernus. And these styles are, as I said, associated with specific time periods and regions. And the evolution of Viking art can be seen as I take you through these different periods. On the left is an Orseberg animal head post found as part of a ship burial. And ship and boat burials were practiced by many seafaring nations in Europe and Asia, particularly the Vikings. The largest ship burial is um, a ship uh, some 20 metres long or 65 feet long. On the right is a cast silver brooch in Boru style. And although I won't go through it in detail, you can see that there are four mask-like heads around the outside. Note the carving of the double lines on the inside are nicked to look like beaded wire, which was used 
as part of um, jewellery and so on. The central knob is riveted on and has eight projecting heads, although it's difficult from this angle to see that they're heads. And the quality of the workmanship in this brooch makes it one of the finest examples of the Borre style that's found in Gotland, which is why I selected it. Incidentally, I, I have got a, a, a close-up of the, um, the head showing you it in a, a sort of a reconstruction and in close-up so that you can see the intricate, interwoven, uh, ornamental work used to make up and represent this um, simplified animal head. This is interesting because although um, I call them Valkyrie, although Valkyries who are female warriors um, were common in Norse mythology and included, referred to in poems and sagas, there are very few figures that can be identified as Valkyries, even though even these where the figures or, or the, the figure here, this is four views of the same figure, um, has a helmet and a shield, which suggests it could be a Valkyrie. We don't know for sure um, whether it's a representation of a female warrior in real life or a representation of a mythological Valkyrie. It was found in Horby in Denmark. The gelling cup on the left, also known as the Gorms Cup, was discovered in 1842 and it was inside a, a royal burial mound which was, we know, established by King Gorm the Old. The decoration is gelling style, intertwined stylized animals with an S-shaped curve is typical of the gelling style. It's a sort of mixture of naturalistic and abstract parts. On the right is a silver inlaid axe found in 1868 in Marmen in Denmark. Uh, thought to date from about 970 and this style consists of intertwined plants and animal elements, intricate details and um, I think a, a, a strong sense of movement. The grave where it was found had other ceremonial items, a costume for example suggesting a high status individual and the the style, this Marmon style, is named after this axe, after the decoration that's found in this axe. And it's also found in other objects such as jewellery and gaming pieces. And um, also the next object I'm going to show you on the left. This is um, the Carmen casket or shrine. Let me first explain a bit of the history so you know why I'm showing you a replica. The Carmen casket was in the Cathedral of St. John in Carmen, Poland, and came, contained the relics of St. Cordula. Unfortunately, it was destroyed in a fire in 1948, and this is a replica. Luckily, a plaster cast and other replicas had already been made some years before, and so this was made by copying those pre-existing replicas. And it's an important example of the Marmon style that we've just seen. On the right is um, something from uh, London, from St. Paul, originally St. Paul's Cathedral. It's a rune stone in Ringerica style. And it's now in the Museum of London. It's thought it was made in memory of a Viking warrior who died in the service of King Canute. And the creature on the stone possibly is Sleipnir, that's Odin's eight-legged horse. Odin was, of course, the chief of the Norse gods and ruler of Asgard, the realm of the gods. Um, 
the there is an inscription on it which reads Gina had this stone laid uh, with Toki. We're not quite sure what that means. On the left is the Pitney because it was found in Pitney, Somerset in England. It's the Pitney disc brooch in metalwork in urns style. Discovered in the 1870s, believed to be 11th century, uh, placing it within the Viking period, which runs up to 1066. And you can see, if you look closely, there's a coiled ribbon-like animal in the centre fighting a snake, possibly biting its own tail. Typical of the urn style, but the scalloped border and the beads running alongside the underside of the animal are more typical of Anglo-Saxon brooches. And so this is um, Viking with Anglo-Saxon influences. On the right is a reliquary, that's a container for religious relics, and it contains the bell of St. Patrick, believed or believed to be the bell of St. Patrick, dating from 6th to 8th century common era, which means it's within the early Christian period of Ireland. And St. Patrick introduced Christianity into Ireland in the 5th century. The outer reliquary, the one we can see, is was made much later, about 1100, from bronze, silver and gold. And the patterns on it, it's the reason I'm showing you, include Viking-inspired elements, but also some Romanesque motifs. And that brings us to the end of this introduction to the Celts, the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings. The Viking Age actually came to an end about the 13th century and the, the Ernst and Ringerica styles uh, survived and thrived until then when the European Romanesque style took over. And, and just I've got one slide just to um, explain that Romanesque is um, art of Europe from about a thousand a uh, CE to the rise of the Gothic style in the 12th century. And we can recognise it as we see here in Durham Cathedral, the, the best example, I think, in England of a pure Romanesque style because of its rounded arches, barrel vaulting, its apses and chevrons and sometimes acanthus leaf decoration, greatly influenced by Byzantine art. The Durham Cathedral was completed around um, 1093 to 1133 was when it was built. The window over on the right is from Poitiers Cathedral and is one of the supreme achievements of Romanesque stained glass in Western France about 1165 to 1170. It's the um, one of the earliest large stained glass windows in a French cathedral. So just to end this period in England with the Norman Conquest in 1066, because a dramatic change took place in the culture of the country at that time. The English were conquered by the Normans at the Battle of Hastings. And I'm showing you here the Bayeux Tapestry made a few years later and the scene depicts King Harold, second from the left, being killed by an arrow landing in his eye. So that brings me to the end of a complex period in English history and a few of the works of art associated with the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings. And I hope I've shown you some representative examples of each of the periods and the way they influenced each other and interleaved. So that's all for now. Thank you for your attention.